<clears throat> All right, so last week we were talking about the very overly very, 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 very confusing object prototypes. I believe we finished up objects, though, so why don't we do a minor amount of review. I wonder if I move this tab over here, if then it won't do that crazy thing. So I'm going to go to my Netlify. By the way, this is... I'll spell it on the board for you. It's N E T. L I F Y dot com? Yeah, dot com. I found this accidentally. Um, it's pretty cool because you can, it's only client side code though, but what you do is you hook your GitHub account up to it, and then anything you push to your GitHub will immediately deploy to your Netlify, and then you can go to Netlify and see your stuff. But it's only client side, so no server side stuff. That includes Node, um, obviously, and then PHP and Ruby and any of those languages. But if you're just trying to do like a JavaScript thing, like just a tiny little JavaScript project, and it's just HTML and CSS and JavaScript, this is awesome because it's completely free. You don't pay for it. So no credit card either. Like Heroku will actually ask you for a credit card if you attempt to attach a domain. This doesn't ask for a credit card. Do you guys get um, DreamSpark? or not DreamSpark, you get Azure. There's another one though that Georgian produces. DreamHost, do you guys get DreamHost as well? Okay, they had a lot of issues with DreamHost and the concurrency issues. Like, so what would happen is you would, all of you would deploy your code, right? And then you'd be like trying to access the database all at the same time and only 10 of you would be allowed to access the database and then the other 10 would get rejected with connection errors. And that happened like all the time. So if you're in the middle of a test and you're trying to like deploy your code and connect to the database, only 10 of you would get successful responses and the other, ten, like the other 40 people would get like fails, which was absolutely terrible and it happened all the time. Azure's not be much better though. I've taught classes where there's been concurrency issues where everybody's connecting to the same database and it's blown up like that. I've had that happen before. Yeah, their license is like, it's like, oh, really? I still have it. It's basically $100 worth. And That's crap. Yeah. yeah. And basically, within the first, I don't know, six, seven months, I end up everything. Well, if you get me in the summer, we use Heroku. So I teach you how to set up Heroku, how to deploy a droplet, how to connect it up to Git. And we use Heroku. And Heroku is completely free, and there's no concurrency issues and crap like that. And then for the database for Mongo, we use MLab which is also completely free and easy to set up, up to, I think it's one gig, which gives you a lot of information, <laughs> surprisingly. You can store a lot of stuff in one gig. So, yeah, it's not too bad. All right, so last week we did part two of objects. <laughs> so I'll just talk quickly about this. We talked uh, mostly about modularity and how modularity is super, uber important when it comes to programming, and it's one of the first things you should be trying to reinforced in your head. You should always be taking a look at code that is redundant and trying to make it more modular and portable uh, so that it, because it makes it a lot more maintainable, right? So when you're not dealing with things that have been copied and pasted in 16 places uh, and now you have to go maintain all 16 places every single time, um, you will become a much more efficient programmer when you can definitely modularize that into one component, one tiny piece. And some frameworks do this really, really well, and they promote this really well. Um, there's different types of frameworks that promote modularity, uh, such as uh, MVC frameworks, right, which is the Model View Controller. Have you guys done Model View Controller yet? Yeah. Yeah, so you guys know how that could basically works. All of your data is basically maintained inside your models, so anytime you need to access things to do with your data, it's in the model. And then the model always inherits from the ORM. The ORM will be like Active Record, or I don't know what MVC you guys did to do ASP. Yeah, I can't remember what their ORM is. <clears throat> but the, basically, all of your data um, is controlled through the models, and then they just inherit from the ORM. And the ORM manages all your query kind of relations, so like doing your finds and your, your inputs and stuff. So basically, your CRUD, right? <clears throat> and then you have your controllers, which help you deal with 
you know, actionables based on the user's routing. So when the user goes to connect to a certain page, the controller handles that information and directs the right content back to them. And then you have your views, which, you know, deal with the actual presentation logic of your website. Uh, that's the end user result is all of your views, right? But the whole point of that is because it's entirely modular. React breaks that down into a little bit of a different idea. React believes in component-based, which means instead of having like model view controller, each component has like its own presentation JavaScript controller type functionality all inside each component. So a home page would be its own component, an about page would be its own component. Whereas MVC is like, no, let's break this all apart. So MVC works in a horror, whichever way this way is, vertical. <laughs> it works in a vertical scaling, where you just keep basically adding more models, controllers, and views. And React works more in a horizontal scaling, which is basically every time I need a new component, I just add it in, and I just keep scaling my system out this way. Yeah. OK. Yeah. We're doing that today. Yeah, the main JS is um, the cart, and the source code is about. Yeah, I re downloaded it. I fixed it um, like a half hour before class. <coughs> yeah, if you've got Lab 5 from last week, I had to fix it just before class. I had a bit of a copy and paste error there. Um, so anyways, yeah, so last week we talked about modularity, like I said, MVC components. There's also other ones like MVM, which is like model view model. Uh, there's MVP, which is a kind of an interesting concept that um, a developer that I worked with, wow, we're getting a whole bunch of errors from our system. Um, anyways, MVP is model view push, which is kind of a weird concept. Uh, instead of pulling data, you're actually pushing data. Um, what other ones are there? There's a whole bunch of different types of systems that are like that. But basically the whole core concept though is to modularize your code. So that way it's only, you're only dealing with one particular aspect of your code and not having to deal with multiple copies of that. So the importance of doing dry, which is don't repeat yourself, is obviously imperative to coding. And it's one of the first things you should learn. And object-oriented programming obviously promotes that. Um, because the whole idea is to have an object that represents an idea and only to work with that object. And then if you need an object that is slightly different, you inherit from that object. Um, we looked at basic class inheritance through like C++ and PHP. And many languages do class inheritance, like Java as well, and Ruby, and all those, they do class inheritance. But JavaScript doesn't do it quite the same way. They use something called prototypal inheritance, which we're going to look at more in depth today. <coughs> um, what else did we talk about? We talked a little bit about object constructors, and we created an object constructor, uh, which is the function, which is just basically a function. Uh, we're going to do another one today, so don't worry if you're kind of still fuzzy on the subject. We're going to do another one today. <coughs> we added methods to it. Uh, what else did we do? We used it. We created a few of them. I showed you how to add unique properties to it and also how to add another method to it as well, I believe. No, we didn't add a method to it. You know, we just added some properties to it. So that was last week. Um, after that, we got slightly into prototyping. We didn't do a lot. Um, I can't remember. Did we wind up taking up the assignment and doing the assignment instead? No, that wasn't last week. That was the week before, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, so we only kind of grazed the surface of object, object prototypes, which is probably good because it is an overwhelming topic. Um, and then... I had the same issue with the Thursday group. They just started glazing over, so we just ended. Because <laughs> it, was, it was just too much. Um, but we can recap a little bit. So we started at the beginning of our main.js file. If you want to go ahead and open up that main.js file from last week for lesson 10, week 10, we'll do the prototype one. We did the first nine steps, it says. Except for I can't count because it should be eight steps. It looks like, no, eight's buried somewhere. Right, we did the first nine steps. <clears throat> so.
So we talked about the two fundamental concepts of how data is passed around a program. Does anybody remember what those two fundamental concepts are? Yeah, Ali? Passed by reference and passed by value. Right, and what's the difference between the two? Um, reference points to like a specific point in memory. Yep. Whereas uh, passed by value takes the value into itself and passes it around. That's correct. It actually copies the value to another point in memory and then gives it that copy. Yeah, so basically what happens is when you pass by value, you're creating more copies in memory as you do this, right? Whereas pass by reference, which is what you want to do as often as possible, and I mean that, literally as often as possible, you want to pass by reference because then instead of creating more copies inside memory, which take more time to read, you are just passing a reference to a point in memory where that value already exists. Okay, so that's really what we want to do, and JavaScript does that very, very well. All objects basically are transferred by reference. They're always passed by reference. Every single object you're going to work with is going to be passed by reference all the time, right? When you access a property, you're accessing a property within that reference point. The whole DOM is entirely built with that concept in mind. When you access an HTML element and then you head towards the event type object, you're actually accessing the event type object inside memory. Every single HTML element accesses the same event type object. Every single HTML element will also access the same node for that particular type. It's just, by reference is so much more efficient and so much faster and cleaner uh, that it definitely supersedes by value. So you want to use it more often. <laughs> we talked about that most things in JavaScript are objects, which I keep repeating every single week. Um, and then we got into object constructors. So we've talked about these a couple of times now. Object constructor constructors are just functions, right? But they do something cool when we actually say to JavaScript, well, first of all, how do I take, it's a magical keyword, how do I take an object constructor and turn it into an actual instantiated object. There's this wonderful, magical keyword. New. New, exactly. When I use new, I'm telling the interpreter that I want to take my JavaScript function, say, that's a constructor, and instantiate an object from it. In the background, I'm just curious if anybody actually remembers what actually happens in the background. When we call new on our function constructor, what happens in the background? Does anybody remember? No? All right. It creates a new empty object in memory. It then sets a new property on the object called prototype. It binds all of the properties that we've set with this. So if you look at our thing in here, there we go, that should be good enough. It takes this dot first name, this dot last name, this dot dob, this dot date format, turns them all into <coughs> properties on the object, and then it returns that newly created object and stores it in whatever variable we had uh, wanted to be assigned to. So all of that magic happens underneath the hood. So what we started with was a function constructor. What we end with is this instantiated object that has all of our values and all of our properties basically transferred over, right, or reference, depending on what we're doing with them. <clears throat> so last week we created a new person. Uh, we created it using a function constructor, as you can see there, um, and then we instantiated it. Uh, we created a new Sean, or you guys created yourselves, right? Um, in addition, we, I showed you how you can actually use the date of birth you can actually create a new object and assign it to a property, which gives us all of the functionality of the date object, right? Which allowed us to be able to create this cool little date format structure um, so that we could get the full year, get the month, get the date, all that type of stuff. And you probably remember none of this from last week. <laughs> all right, so why don't we instantiate a new object under step three? I'm just going to open up my wonderful console because I think that's where we're spitting everything out. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. There we go. Wow, we've got lots of... Why do I have all of that? I shouldn't have all of that. Oh, because I'm in the wrong one. There we go. Now this is the correct one. That's better. Oh yeah, look at all the errors. 
Do, do, do. Why do we have so many errors? That's better. One more time. There we go. All right, so we had spit out the Sean. Let's create another one to instantiate our object. We'll just do let, I'm going to say Dave equals new person. Dave. And we give Dave the last name of that. And then we'll make Dave's birthday. Let's make him really old. 1876. The ninth month of the 25th day. There we go. <laughs> no idea what's funny. He's not really a new person then. No, he's not very new. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> All right. You're hilarious. Um, let's spit Dave out because he tastes terrible. There we go. And as you can see, our constructor just gives us this blueprint that we can work with and we can create multiple people based on the constructor. The constructor is just going to provide basically a framework, kind of, that allows us to set the name, set the last name, right? Create a date of birth object that we can now work with, and then provide us a handy form, like a handy uh, function, like date.format, which we can utilize to actually spit out the date. So why don't we do that? We'll do Dave just underneath the console.log for Sean. I'm going to do dave.dob. Bam. There we go. Looks like he was born on a Monday. September 25th, 1876. And we can call our actual date format as well, which we did on step 9. So I'll do that for Dave as well. Log dave.date format. There we go. And we formatted the date in the format that I preferred. You guys may have done your own different types of format. If you wanted to know where to edit your format, you could do it on line 14 there. You can change that string so you can put the year or month in any order you really want. How you want to actually format is totally up to you. So object constructors, um, when we're working with them, they provide another very important keyword that we use inside of them in order to reference different properties that are inside. What is that important keyword? I keep usually putting it in finger quotes. It's in every single class inherited language, every object oriented language, and it's always in reference to the owner object. Yes, this. This is a very important keyword, just like new. This and new are crucial to object-oriented programming. New helps us instantiate objects. This helps us to create reference to the object itself when we're internally in it. Um, both are very, very crucial to working with the objects. When we create a functional constructor, we have access to this. This actually refers to person directly. And we showed that when you do console.log. Um, you can see that it always refers to the actual owner object, the owner object being person themselves, right? <clears throat> That's how we're able to do this dot first name, this dot dob, this dot you know dob dot get mut date. It's because we're referring internally inside the object, so we're able to access whatever property we have inside there. There's no confusion to what we're working with. There's problems if we were to do it just referencing the parameter. And that's if one, if the parameter isn't passed, then we can't actually do anything with it. We won't have access to it. Um, there was another one. I showed the actual example, and I can't remember what it was now. But the point is, is you want to be able to set those arguments when they're passed as the actual property values. Um, that way you have access to, it, access to it internally throughout the object. All right, so we created our person constructor using objects as values. We did all this stuff. What step are we on? 10? Do, do, do. 
Right. This is why we ended class. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about proto. Proto. <laughs> underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore, which I'm not going to say it that way because it's annoying. Proto's on every object. Every object. Inside JavaScript. And because most things are objects, you can safely assume that proto is on almost everything. Um, proto provides something called prototype chaining. So basically every object has the property proto. Proto is a property that stores the reference relationship to an object's constructor and properties. Let's look at some common data types we work with further, proving that most things are actually objects. So let's do that first, and then we'll dive more into proto. So if we do console.log, sorry, console.dir, D-I-R, and then we can actually create any of the data types that we've worked with, right? So let's take a look at some of the data types that we actually work with. We work with, uh, we work with, I'll start you off, we work with string, right? What's some other ones? Number. Yeah, number. It's funny, you guys should start a quartet. Number. Array. <laughs> yeah, array is another one. Array. And there's two more? Yeah. Yeah, object. And function. And there's one I didn't write down. Yes, Boolean. Now, incidentally, these are not the only data types that exist because every time you create a new object from a class, you are actually, that class becomes a new data type. Not sure if you knew that. Yeah, so HTML element is technically a data type. Node is a data type. Event target is a data type. These all become data types. Whenever you create, that's every object oriented language, by the way. Every object oriented language. When you create a class, you're creating a new data type, essentially. So we can actually instantiate these just like we would with any object. And the way we do it, how do we instantiate an object? New, right? String, and the name of the object. So that creates new string. And if you look in your console here, you will see the string object down here with the little arrow beside it, that little chevron that I love to click and look at what's inside this thing. <clears throat> but before we do that, let's complete steps 11 through to 14. I mean, you can follow along, but I'm pretty sure you can figure out what to do. So we're going to create a new array. You know what? Because all of these are basically the same, I'm going to type them all out at the same time. New. Oh, this is where array should have went. There we go. And and then I'll just change the names out. Number, object, function. <coughs> and because all of these can be instantiated, you can see that they are all technically objects. So when we create one of these things, it's creating a child of these things, right? So we're actually creating that object. <clears throat> to further prove that these are all objects, if you click the little arrow beside these guys, you will see this wonderful thing called Proto. And what Proto is doing is it's telling you its inheritance chain, right? It's called prototypal chain. So our string object, right, when we create a new string, we're actually creating a new object, right? So we have this new guy called OBJ, we'll just say. His name is OBJ, right? And he was instantiated from string. So he is technically inheriting from the string object. That's where he's coming from. So we're one into the chain. If we kick that little proto button, you're going to get a big list of all the methods that are available to string. And incidentally, our little OBJ guy, this guy right here, has access to all of those methods. The way it works is if I was to call font color, for example, 
unless OBJ has a property called font color, it's going to go, no, you don't have one. Wait, do you have one? Do you have a font color? Oh, you do. Cool. Then I'm going to call that method on that. Sounds like inheritance, doesn't it? Right? Sounds like public inheritance, essentially. Public and what's the other one that gives a view? Protected. Protected. Public and protected. No, private. Sorry. Public and private inheritance. <laughs> if we scroll down a little further in the list, you'll notice another proto. We click that one. This one's called object. And all of the properties available to the object become available to us. And string is actually inheriting from the object. And then that's where we stop, because you'll notice there's no proto after that point. So string is an object. It's literally an object, because it's inheriting from the object, which is the base, without being repetitive, is the base object, because object is an object. <laughs> yeah, boom, whatever. <laughs> I get that. So this gets, this is literally with every single one. If you click on number, Again, we start with our OBJ, and it's inheriting from number. And then you'll notice there's number doesn't have quite as many properties available to it. You know, you get to exponential, to fixed. You can cast a string, that kind of stuff. But then we hit the proto. And what is proto? Proto is object. So number, if you do, it is safe to say number inherits, well, it's by reference, so we can just point to it because they're all pointing to literally the same thing. Again, same with the array. Yes, I realize this is repetitive, but it's pointing out that when we create a new array, we actually gain all of its properties, right? All these wonderful functions that you guys saw that many of you were cursing me on the test about. <laughs> they're all there, and then the object, right? And then we have object. Object inherits, obviously, from object and then stops there. And then function also has a prototype. It prototypes from function, which prototypes from object. So the whole point of this is that we're basically passing the reference like so. We're passing the reference and inheriting any properties that are available from that object to the next object and to the next object. This shows that all of these are actually objects and they're all gaining the inheritance through something called prototypal chaining. <coughs> what do you need to know? All you need to know is that if the method you're looking for on your base object isn't there, go check under the proto <laughs> because it's very possible that what you're looking for might be under the proto, which means it might be available to you, even though you don't realize it. And a good example of this is definitely the DOM. So we're going to do one more console that isn't listed here. We're going to console.dir, and we're just going to do a document.query selector. And why don't we just grab the body tag? Okay. I want to make this super tall. There we go. You can see that we have the body tag there. Just going to click the arrow beside the body tag. This is no different than any other object that you're working with, right? So let's, uh, let's see what we're starting with. We're starting with body. OK. Let's see what inherits from it. Does anybody want to tell me what it's inheriting from? So where do we find the inheritance? Under what property? Right, and where did you find that? Proto. Underneath proto. So it's pretty easy to find. It's always at the bottom of the list. So proto, it's a good concept to understand because it will likely be on the test of this chain. I'll ask, and you can use the console to find it. There we go. Now, let's see if you're paying attention. Are we done our chain? No. How will we know when we're done our chain? Eventually, either get to document or 
The second one was the correct one. <laughs> object. <laughs> Every single object in JavaScript inherits from object. Every single one. So you know you're done your chain when you hit object. That's it. You're finished. All right. So what's the next one, Nelly? Uh, That's right. So now we're into HTML element. And you may be like, well, why are these two things different? That's because body may actually contain functionality, properties, data that is different than the HTML element, right? Just like when you do class inheritance, you build a very generic class. Right? You guys have probably taught that day one pretty much, right? You build this very generic class, and then you get more specific as you inherit it or derive from it, right? So each child becomes more and more specific as you go down the chain. It's no different. We start at extremely specific, <laughs> right, body. Then we inherit from the body element, which is a little bit more specific. Then we're into HTML element. OK, so now it's just some random thing on the page, right? And then what's next, Sally? Element. Yeah, element. And that's because element can actually be applicable to other things that aren't necessarily in the body. It's basically any element, right? But we're not done. From element, we go to what? Node. Yeah, node. And what does node inherit from? The event target. The event target. What do you think the event target's responsible for? What's that? Did you say pancakes? <laughs> it's going to inherit from likely object. I believe it does. Yeah, but what is the event target responsible for? We've done so Events. much of this. Events, exactly. So all of your what? Clicks, right? Mouse downs, mouse overs, user interactions, even the events you create all get passed through event target. All right, so we got event target. And then I think, I, yep, Virginia gave it away. And the last piece at the end of the chain is object, right? <coughs> now you may be like, OK, well, I'm just going to take a picture of that and bring it to the test. <laughs> but do you really need to? That's pretty easy, right? Just follow the proto. Follow the proto all the way down the chain until you get to the end, and then you can see. And so what's really cool is this has access to all those properties, 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 all those properties. All the way through has access to every single one of these. But you can override them, right? Just like you can in class inheritance. You can override them. So if I have on... Let's see, I can't remember where it actually comes from. I think it comes from him. So if I have dot .query selector, right, which we've seen, we've used quite often, this property belongs to HTML element, but I have access to it on body. It calls this one. Hi, Steve. <laughs> now, if I was to set a property in here called .query selector, it will actually override that. Okay? And it's that easy. The cool thing about all of this, I don't know, depends on who you ask. <laughs> some people like this, some people hate this. What are we missing? Like in class inheritance, we have three things called visibility modifiers, right? Do you know what the visibility modifiers are? Yep, you're spot on. Public, private, and protected. Do you think that exists in this model? <laughs> no. This has access to all of those at all times. You can't set visibility. There is no such thing as visibility available to any of the other things. They don't, they don't understand that. They're just ready to share. They're just they're kindergartens, they want to give them all the other kindergarten smallpox. That's what's happening in this scenario. They're just like, here, take my everything. <laughs> That's the way it works. Now, ES6 introduces the class, 
And I believe the class inside ES6 does have the ability to use visibility modifiers. But underneath the hood, it's all done with prototypes and a lot of black magic <laughs> in order to get it to kind of do the things you want it to do. So understanding prototypal inheritance, it's very similar to classes, and that's probably the step that I would suggest you use in your head for now. MPJ would disagree if you guys have watched any of the fun fun functions. Um, but yeah, it's very similar. Like it, the way inheritance kind of works is kind of the same idea. The one thing to understand though is that these objects in inheritance, you in inheritance you have to instantiate, 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 but when you instantiate a new parent class, that parent class exists. If you instantiate again, there's a new parent class in memory. These both exist in memory at the same time, right? In this model, there's only one object. There's only ever one object because of the way referencing works in JavaScript. So you won't be creating copies of this. You'll only ever have one. You only ever have one event target. You only ever have one node that you're working from. You may only have one HTML element, right? But what will happen is the body will set any specifics that you require. Now, I don't expect you to know that. I'm not going to test the crap of you on that on the test. Um, any questions I ask will be on that page, the object prototype page. Okay? That's my promise to you because in full disclosure, I don't fully understand object prototyping at like a deep depth. But I use it. I use it often. But... I don't understand it to a deep depth. I just understand the basic concept that this object gets the contents from this object and it passes up the chain. And I know how to create them. Cool. <laughs> so everything in that page is what I would recommend having with you on the test, okay? All right, cool. Any questions? That was kind of a bit of a bleh. Definitely a dump, so to speak. Let's make some more stuff. Who doesn't like to make stuff? All right. Uh, okay, we did all that. All right, explaining prototype. So, proto and prototype. Prototype is basically the same as proto, but it's a property that is made specifically for function constructors. So when you create a new object from a function constructor, you get this property called prototype. Prototype allows you connection through the prototypal chain, this big thing. <coughs> but prototype stores in a bit more information. It stores in the constructor you're working with. It stores in all of its properties that you're working with, which goes back to those four steps of what happens when you click new. and Or sorry, type in new in the function. All right, prototype is a property that is applied to all functions. The property exists to allow you to create inheritance to other properties and objects. This is known as prototypal chaining. Let's create a new property on our person constructor object that returns the age of our instantiated person. All right, so in order to add a method to this, we can't just go person.property like we've done in the past. We're not able to do that. And the reason is is because we need to be able to add prototype to the person object itself. If we just do Sean.property, is that property available to Dave? No, it's not, because it's specific to Sean. Remember overwriting, right? We've overwritten it and we've made it very specific to just Sean. If we want both Sean and Dave to have access to this new prototypal property, to this new method, we have to access it through the prototype. So we're going to do that now. We're going to add a new prototype property to our person object. And we're going to call it get age. So person.prototype. That's accessing that prototype property that was created on our function. <coughs> get age equals, and then it's just creating a function, just like we are regularly do. Okay. Now, this is kind of a cool little function. We're actually going to get the difference between two dates and then format that into an age. So we're going to say let diff equal date.now. 
So I'm sure you can guess that's today. DOB, right? Get time. Sorry, this should be this.dob, not just DOB. Get time. Okay. What that will do is it will take today's date and subtract the get time that we get back, which actually gets returned as like an epoch time. I think it returns back as epoch. Yes, it turns back as epoch, which is just basically the number of seconds that have passed between that point in time to now. All right. Then we're going to say let age equal new date, and we're going to give it our epoch. And then we're going to say return, use some math, math dot abs, as people know that mathematicians have abs, age dot get UTC full year minus 1970. Seems very specific, but <laughs> that's what works. I honestly got this from the internet, so I didn't make this up. <laughs> <coughs> so that basically date dot now will return back the number of seconds for today that represent today since. I believe it's since 1970 is how it works. And then this dob.getTime will return back the number of seconds since 1970. We'll be subtracting those two from each other. That will give us back a small percentage or so a diff, and then we'll be able to spit that out. So if we wanted to see all these things, this is something I encourage that I've noticed a lot of people don't do. Um, Console.log is your best friend, especially when you're trying to troubleshoot your code. Console.log is your absolute best friend, okay? So you can do console.log, and we can spit out the diff. Well, why don't we do date.now, this.dob.getTime, and then the diff. And while we're at it, we'll do the age. There we go. And we can see all these wonderful pieces. Obviously, that's not going to work till we call it. So I'm going to call it Sean.getAge. There we go. So there's the date.now. This is the this.dob.getTime. This is the difference between those two times. This is the age that gets spit back as a date stamp. And then this is the full year, which would have returned back I'm not sure what that would have returned back um, before that. Uh, I'm curious. Math. Actually, no, I just want the age.get UTC full year. Whoops, too many things. Oh, a one. There we go. Sean.a get age. Oh, what did it return back 2009? Because it's the difference between the two. So then you subtract 1970 from it and you get what's left over, <coughs> which is 39 for my case. So let's see how old Dave is. So we will actually put this into our code. So we'll just say console.log Sean.get age and console.log. Dave.getAge. And save it. Sean's 39. Oh, I want to remove this console log because it's annoying. There we go. Sean's 39, and Dave's likely dead at 143. Sean, uh, the reason it's 1970 is that zero in your next. Right. Yeah, because it starts from 1970. So yeah. anything that's before 1970 is minus? Right. That is so true. People peeking at my code from the window. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so now we have Dave and Sean, and we have their ages. So the prototype 
is the property that's applied to the function constructor. And in order for us to apply the get age function, we need to add it to the prototype so it becomes available to Sean and Dave. If we hadn't made an object literal, then we would have been able to just apply it to the literal. But we didn't, so this is the way we have to do it. Our person object has inherited the get age function definition. This should open your eyes to realize that get age could be defined and assigned to any object, not just person. So that's the other cool thing about get age. We can actually now apply that to a totally different object if we ever wanted to. <clears throat> this is a simple example of extending our object using the prototype method. We can further extend our object by having it inherit aspects of other objects, basically a parent-child kind of relationship. Now we're going to create another new function constructor called superhero, and then we will have it inherit most of its blueprint from person. So now we're actually going to inherit down. We're going to take person as our base, and we're going to derive from it. Right? Are you guys familiar with that word, derive? Yeah, okay. Cool. For those of you that aren't derived, just mean basically means a child of the base class. Base class being the parent class, right? So person is our base class. The derivment will be, is it derivment? Derivant? Derivative? derivative. Yeah, it would be the derivative, yeah. The derivative will be the superhero class. So first we're going to do, we're going to add a new constructor function called superhero. So let superhero, by the way, I use capitals when I name constructor functions. You don't have to. There's not like a rule about it. We need to make sure that we collect the same instantiation um, parameters that we used in person because we're going to need those to help call person, right? There we go. I'm going to add the closing brace just underneath step 19. Now we're going to add a new property called alias, because obviously superheroes have aliases. And we're going to say this dot alias is equal to alias. Seems redundant. However, if you don't actually give the property this dot alias a value, if you just say this dot alias semicolon, when you go to instantiate your constructor, it won't copy the property over. It has to have a value in it. Found that out today when I was trying to demonstrate to my programming partner. We were talking about this very subject. Then, in order to inherit our person object, we have to instantiate it using the call method. This is almost like if you were to call super in some languages, um, or if it was C++, you were to call the actual parent object inside there. Um, it's basically the equivalence to just calling and instantiating the parent object. That allows us to take the, basically photocopy the properties into, well, it doesn't copy, basically create the reference to those properties into our superhero object. And we do this by doing person.call. We have to pass this, which is the superhero um, object, then all those properties. First name, last name, and DOB. By the way, this is one way to do this. Just like JavaScript most times has, there's multiple ways to do this. I'm going to show you another way after the break. Um, I consider the second way simpler than this. I actually, I like this way because I'm used to this, doing it this way. But I do like the second way because I feel it's simpler to understand. <clears throat> All right, almost done. Next, we're going to take our superhero prototype because we're almost finished here. We're going to take our superhero prototype and we're going to make it equal to our person prototype and then we'll be done our inheritance. So superhero dot prototype equals object dot create person dot prototype. That's it. All of that in order to create the inheritance chain. <laughs> Now superhero inherits from the superhero. The reason why we have to do this step here, superhero.prototype 
equals object dot create person dot prototype is because we created that get age method. Because we applied that to the prototype, this is our way of being able to create the reference to that to the person prototype. Yes, I know it's confusing. I totally grasp the concept that it's confusing. <clears throat> Feels like a lot of work for inheritance. The one thing that you I will say is it's not very often you do this unless you're making your own plugins and things like that and you're doing a lot of inheritance stuff. Most times when I build a plugin, I usually wind up just prototyping all my methods into it. And I'm very, I don't think I've ever done inheritance. I've never had to, there was no reason to. So yeah, but the second way I'll show you is a little simpler. Uh, anyways, step 21, let's create a new superhero. So I'm gonna create the Incredible Hulk. You create whoever you want. I'm gonna say the Incredible Hulk equals new superhero. And that is like a method. <clears throat> and something kind of cool in JavaScript, in a lot of languages, is you can actually separate those brackets like this and then type your properties or your arguments inside. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to say the Incredible Hulk, because that's his alias. I don't know why it just populated everything for me. I appreciate it, but I don't want it. like saying you don't know me there we go banner <laughs> you're not from my church there we go cool that's my object doesn't matter you can do seven yeah it doesn't matter but it does interpret it so why not I think it looks easier to read, I find, when you do the, the zero delimited, yeah. <clears throat> then our last step before we take a small break, uh, well, maybe we'll take a longer break. Our last step will be to use console log, console.log, and we're gonna out output the date of birth, um, so the name of your object, dot, date format, like so. And I'm also going to do the age. The Incredible Hulk dot get age. And this will show you that the Incredible Hulk has inherited the date format from person and has also inherited get age from person. And I save, there we go. The Hulk was born on the 11th month, 06, 1956, and he is 62. So I will likely ask you to build a inheritance chain like that on the midterm, but what I will provide you is the steps on the midterm. So it should be clear on the steps that you need to do, and I'll be very verbose because they don't expect you to just remember it, okay? Actually, I'll probably ask you to do one of the two ways. So there's two different ways that we're going to do this, and you can do either one. <clears throat> All right, so that's it for right this second. Why don't we take, yeah, we'll take a break. Why don't we take a 15-minute break, then we'll finish this off. I'll issue out the lab. You guys can work on the lab. And then I will talk about the assignment too while you're doing the lab. That way, you know, you have your choice if you want to dodge out early. And wow, well, the snow stopped, but you have your choice if you want to dodge out early. So go ahead, take 15 minutes, regroup, clear your heads, go to the TLC and get a drink, come back. <laughs> Leave it there though, don't bring it back. I'm not that quick, let's be real. <laughs> So my guess, no. the reason why you don't mind us dance, right? Yeah, he told me that. My dad made that one. Which tells you a lot about.
Pretty good deal. Don't you wear your first is our worst ones. Oh, yeah. So you're doing Yes, very, very high grade. Lower quantity, but. Yes, the foreign slash is because you do it that way, it wants year. No, sorry, it wants day here. If you use dashes, then you can convert it to year month. Uh, I think I should charge you money. More? Thank you. still getting it. It's still doing it? Do you know about the 2038 problem? The Yeah, versus inheritance. Yeah. Was it composition versus inheritance? Yes, it's composition versus inheritance. And I bet you if I click videos, yep, MPJ. Yeah, watch this video. <laughs> uh, I will copy it and I will put it in the blackboard. New tab. Do, do, do. Assignment two is going to be easy and not so difficult. Resume. We'll scroll down. We did the prototype explanation. Cool. So in the above code that we just did, we created our superhero object constructor that inherited the properties and methods defined in the person object constructor. And in addition, we have signed the person prototype to our superhero prototype, which will copy over the methods that we define outside of the constructor. That's why it's done in two steps. Um, this is only one way to accomplish inheritance in JavaScript. But as with many things in JavaScript, as you guys are slowly finding out, 
it isn't the only way. <laughs> we can also use object literals and object create to accomplish the same thing. And I actually find it clear. To me, it's clear. Like, it'll be totally up to you which one you consider to be clearer to you. But I just find this makes more sense to me. Making a function constructor feels really bizarre and kind of janky. So I really like the way this is done. So we're going to work with food. And the reason why I chose food is because I would really like you to watch the prototype video by Fun Fun Function. And he uses food to accomplish the same thing. And I feel like that would help you reinforce the knowledge. You should be definitely watching those Fun Fun Function videos. Um, on prototypes. Like, it's really a good idea. It's a good idea always to take what I teach you and then reinforce that learning from somebody else at the same time, um, which will help you better understand what we're working with, okay? <clears throat> All right, so create a new object literal called food. Okay, so we're going to create const food. I like food. Everybody likes food. And you don't really have a choice if you want to live. Well, <laughs> You don't have to like food, you just have to eat it. You, you have to eat it. You don't necessarily <laughs> have to like it. I, I, I'm one of those people that doesn't necessarily like food. Very much. You don't have like a go-to food? No, I find it very time consuming. We got to do three times a day. I agree with that. Oh my God. There's like, there's foods that I love, but they're so messy, I avoid them. Like ribs. I love ribs and I love wings, Occasionally, but. Occasionally, like, I like barbecue sauce. Overall, yeah. but it's messy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I don't guys stir fry every night for the last like six years. Oh, shit. That's what you've been eating? for. Uh, uh, you do love stir fry. Yeah, that's not, yeah I mean, stir fry is a pretty yeah. open ended, yeah. like, generic term yeah. for <laughs> food. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I like a lot of sautéed things, and I call them stir fry. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> All right, so we're going to create a new function. We're going to call it init. Now, this is not, I don't want you to get hung up. This is one of those times that I find people get hung up on words. They're like, oh, if I want to create an initializer function, then I need to call it init. That is not the case. I'm just calling it init. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't mean anything to the object. The object's like, cool, i got a property called init. Cool beans. That's it. It's not actually going to do anything. Um, I'll even prove it. We'll call it Jenky in it, just to show you that it doesn't actually do anything. It's just a, just a name. And we're going to say function, and we're going to give it a parameter called type. <clears throat> if you don't want to call it Jenky in it, you don't have to. And I'm going to say this.type equals type. <clears throat> So what you will notice is there's a little bit of a different type of flow to when you create your actual object constructor. You don't want to think of the function constructor, right? Because it like enforces something. When you actually create the function constructor and you give it arguments, you have to pass those arguments. You have no choice, right? This you have to more think in you're going to do things in steps when you instantiate it. You're going to create the object. Then you're going to pass the parameters to the initial function. So you're doing things more in a step by step. And I actually find, to me, that's a simpler concept. Because this is a uh, object, we have to use commas to separate our properties, right? So I'm going to put my comma there to separate my property. I'm going to put this up here. Then I'm going to write the next one. We're going to create an eat function. Eat functions. Function is the property? Function is the property's value. Janky init is the property. <laughs> That's why I name things like that, just so I can say those words. Oh, why did I do that? I'm being retur I'm being totally stupid here. One second. Fixed. There, it's fixed. There. Alright, so init. Uh, no, eat function, so we're going to return you ate the, we're using dirty backticks, not single, col single apostrophes, whatever they're called, single quotes. And in the end, we got there. <laughs> All right, this.type, if you watch MPJ do this, he makes waffles. And then he sings about them. 
You ate the waffle. You ate the waffle. <laughs> it's pretty funny. All right, and then we're going to create a property, just a regular property with just a, just a regular old value. It'll be category, and we're going to call our category food. Category is food. Don't forget those commas, right? Because these are properties. So when you create an object, right, you have prop <coughs> e, right, like that, and then your value. And now if I want to create another property, I have to do comma, prop two, value two. And if I want to do another one, comma, and you just keep doing that, right? That's how we separate them. That's exactly what we're doing here, even though the comments are kind of in the way. <clears throat> just so you're aware, when the interpreter actually rips through your code, it takes all of your comments and rips them out. Totally compresses, removes all the tabs, all the spaces, all of your nice fancy formatting gets completely ripped out when the interpreter rips through your code. So you don't have to worry about where you put comments as long as it doesn't wind up commenting out code. Some people think that their comments will interfere with the code. It won't. Totally won't. All right. So that's our object. This is our constructor object, we're going to say. And we've called it food, right? And food has some basic functionality attached to it that we can use. Now I'm going to create a new object that's going to inherit all of its properties from food. So I'm going to call this vegetable. Const vegetable. There we go. Equals object dot create food. Things are more fun when you say them that way. Vegetable and food. So this is what I mean by you have to think in a kind of a different concept, right? Because I've created a vegetable and it is now inheriting all of food's properties, but now I want to initialize my vegetable, right? So in order to initialize my vegetable, I'm going to say vegetable dot janky init. And then I'm going to give it its parameter and I'm going to say its type is vegetable. There we go. I've inherited and I've technically initialized. I feel like this gives me more flexibility in my code. It gives me a lot more control over what I want to do. Now I'm going to override the eat function. And if I did that inside the function constructor, what, what very important property would I have to utilize in order to add another or even to override a method inside my function constructor? Yeah, prototype. I'd have to use prototype. But with object literals, I don't. I don't have to do any of that prototypal blah. Right? It's just safe. It's just straight and simple. There's no problem. It's very easy to do. I'm going to override vegetable dot eat equals function, just like we learned how many weeks ago? Two weeks ago. And I'm going to say return eat your veggies exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark. So I've showed you inheritance in one way. So vegetable is inheriting from food, but we can keep our inheritance chain, right? So vegetable is still pretty broad. Let's get more specific. Let's create a carrot. All right, so we're going to say const carrot equals object.create vegetable. There we go. Now I have a carrot that is inheriting all of its properties from vegetable, which is inheriting all of its properties from food. So everything passes down the chain, right? And I want to initialize my carrot, so I'm going to call carrot dot init carrot. And init, sorry, janky init, not just init. Janky init, there we go. Carrot. How old and or new is this word janky? I don't know. My programming person says it, like the, the guy that I work with every day, says it all of the time. This is the first time I've ever heard this. 
Really? He's 23, so I don't know. Do you use Janky all the time? You do too? Yeah, you're not reinforcing the age issue though here. <laughs> oh, yeah. So maybe the 90s? This guy plays guitar and listens to a lot of 90s music, so maybe that's why. Yeah. Kind of like how people like listen to 70s music and then they start picking up the slang from it. <laughs> I don't know how common that is. <laughs> all right, so now we can output all three levels of the properties, OK? And I can show you how this inheritance kind of works. Remember what I was saying before, that we had OBJ, right? And it inherited from string, and it inherited from object, right? And I said, if OBJ doesn't have the property has property, right? Because object has this property attached to it called has property. I feel like not typing anymore. Um, writing. <laughs> Anyways, has property. So when you call, if you call OBJ dot has property, you get point. If it doesn't exist, it's going to go, Whoo, hello, do you have it? And string's going to say, no, I don't have it, but I'll tell you what. I'll ask my inheritance, do you have it? Object's like, dude, we got you. So it passes it back, and the definition winds up getting written to here. That's inheritance, right? You guys have done that with classes, right? Same kind of idea, same kind of concept. Now, if OBJ overwrites this, then it uses that. If string overwrites it, it will use that. So it's whatever, wherever the property is closest. So if OBJ has property, it will use it. If it doesn't, it's going to check with string. If it has property, it'll use that. If it doesn't, it's going to move to object and ask it. And it just keeps going down the chain till it finally reaches the end and may get back undefined if it can't find it. All right, so let's take a look at this and see if we can kind of figure out what's going to happen. <coughs> so we created our food object, right? And our food object has janky init as one function, it has eat as another function, and it has the category food. Steve is loving this word janky. He's going to use it all the time going forward. Yeah. And then we created a new object, which is inheriting from our food using object.create. Very powerful structure that thing is, object.create. Object.create takes food, and it references all of its properties and passes those to vegetable for us, which is very cool. So anyways, object.create food is going to pass all of its references to vegetable. And then we're calling janky init. Where is janky init coming from? What object is giving us janky init? What object gives us janky init? Food. Yeah, exactly. Food. Food's giving us janky init. Then we create vegetable.eat function return eat your veggies. Okay? Now, we have eat your veggies. Is that going to come from here if we reference it? Or will it come from here? So if we do vegetable.eat, is it going to use the one that we assigned on lines 114 to 116? Or is it going to use the method defined of food? Yes, Steve? Will use one? It will use the closest one, which is vegetable or food? Uh, vegetable. Yes, it will use vegetable. Then we create a new object called carrot, and then we initialize it using janky init. Is it using janky init on vegetable or on food? Trick question, food, because we didn't, we didn't set it on vegetable, right? OK, we can show this by doing some console logging, our favorite thing. Console.log carrot.type. That's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to ask for the caret dot type. And then we're going to save it. And we're going to zoom this up a bit so I can see things. There we go. And we get food. Right? Why do we get food? Did you get caret? This dot type equals type. If I done something goofy, oh, I bet you I need to refresh. 
Yes. I need to refresh, but I'm still getting food. No, that's on line 125. What is happening here? Oh, I'm not in the right. Sorry. Yes, I get caret. That makes sense because we're initializing, right? So we've set the property of this dot type to caret because, and that's now on caret itself. And if we were actually spit out caret, which I can show you, console.log, spit out caret, we get the little arrow, right? We can see that caret only has two properties. One is the type, which we've overridden, right? So now we're not using type in food anymore. We're now using type at caret. And if we click the little proto button, you can see that we're getting eat and type of vegetable being transferred to us. So if we didn't have a type, it would use vegetable and it would return back vegetable. All right, so let's do the vegetable level. Console.log. Again, we're going to call caret. Caret dot eat. What is that going to return? Eat your veggies, right? Because now it's passing. It doesn't have an eat method on it, but vegetables does. And it inherits from vegetables, so it's going to call the vegetables one. If vegetables didn't have an eat method, what would it call? Food. food. Exactly. It would call foods. Last one. Console.log. Carrot dot category. What is it going to be? That's right, it's going to be food. That's because vegetable doesn't have dot .category on it, so it can't find it there. So it moves up the chain and finds it on food. Now, here's the million dollar question. <clears throat> Just curious, how many think function constructors are easier to understand versus this? You do like function constructors over this? A couple of you? Okay, people are uh, okay. So four people. How many people think this is much simpler? What do you mean a by little this clearer. Again? What's that? What do you mean by this? So just using object literals to do inheritance versus building a function constructor using prototyping and calling the dot call method in order to instantiate the pair. Pair different. Whatever you happen to come across is what you'll use. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I feel like this is a little simpler to understand because it's just object literals. I don't need to use the prototype. I don't need to instantiate the object that way. I don't need to add things through the prototypal method. I can just use object literals. And if you watch the fun fun function, this is the way he uses most times. He will use object literals to do this. The functional constructors, I can see a purpose for them though. Um, especially if you require things to be created at that time. You can also technically use a blend of both. You can create a function constructor and you can have an object literal inherit from it. Like, you can totally do that. So you can have a blend of both methods. All right, let's move to the lab. <clears throat> any questions about any of this? We're going to do the lab and I'll be walking around so you guys can ask questions then too as well. Uh, let's open up the lab. I believe... I would recommend pulling it down fresh because it is slightly different than what it was last week. It's basically uh, the same. No, it's just the stupid block at the bottom said storyteller and it wasn't supposed to. I'm just, it's just fuck up with me. <laughs> All right. It's under weekly learning. However, the submission is under labs. I got that fixed. All right. So underneath weekly learning, click on lab five. That'll pull down your starter file, which looks a little like this. This is the finished result. The finished result will produce five cards and constantly keep refreshing those five cards. Now, incidentally, hold on, I have to pause before I say this. Okay, so anyways, <laughs> Von Awesome is providing us these little hearts and clubs and stuff. So that's where that's coming from, those little icons. There's the part one information. There's only seven steps. I've done the more complicated stuff for you. It's already finished, but please do review it, though. Look over that code. Don't just scan it and leave it. Take a look at it so you can kind of get a better understanding of what's happening. But then go through those seven steps and complete the seven steps. And then, how many of you have already done Lab 5? Just out of curiosity. Pretty close. Pretty close. You've finished it? Okay, so for those of you that are done and want to move on to something different, do we want to talk about assignment two? 
All right, assignment two, I like reined it in. So it's not like some crazy game. And I coded it out <laughs> from beginning to end to make sure it was totally doable. It wasn't just a whim. So it's called Procrastinate No More. Can you guess what we're building? Uh, task manager. Yes, a to-do list, right? Because how many to-do lists can you possibly build in your student career, right? <laughs> the only thing is, though, is this one is definitely useless because there's no permanent storage. So the second you turn your computer off, your to-do list is gone. <laughs> Anyways, or close your browser. So um, no longer will you procrastinate and forget important tasks unless you close your browser. At, uh, I wrote at least until you refresh. Uh, a to-do list is a list of things to do, right? This is a classic assignment. The idea is you can create a new item entry with a due date and add it to a growing list of things to do. For this assignment, it is encouraged that you work in pairs, okay? You don't have to. It's just encouraged. Everybody's like, I don't want to work in pairs. People frighten me. But it's totally up to you. If you want to work in pairs, work in pairs. If you don't, don't, right? Um, using what we've learned over the last 10 weeks, create a to-do list application. You need to be able to do these things. Add a new item. Edit that item. Remove that item, right? So basic crud. And then your to-do list should have some nice styling and a decent user experience. Now, I provided you Bootstrap in there. There's those things. There's that thing we just talked about that I paused for that you're welcome to use as well to help add extra you know, icons. Um, your instructions are there. And then there's the take it further as always. So let me open up that actual assignment. Do -do -do. Assignments to. So starter, starter complete. You know what? I'll actually open it, open it. Let's create a new tab here. T. Incidentally, I don't know if you knew you could do this. If you have a terminal over here, you can actually drag and drop, and it will throw the path in for you. Yeah. <laughs> Where was that five years ago? <laughs> you can do that in Windows. You can do that in Linux. You can do that in a Mac. Yeah. Any language can do that. This is the to-do list. This is what it looks like. You add your to-do entry. My to-do entry. You can do a date. I even did like the date type on it, so it gives you a little selector for it. That's just a Chrome thing. I think it might even be in Firefox now. And then you click Create New Item, and it creates a new item. And then you can edit your new item. My to-do entry to-do today, right? And then you can delete your new item. It's gone. The whole code is 35 lines. Yeah. 35 lines. That's it. I'm going to show you, kind of. Not showing you that. I'm not. I'm also not showing you that one. <laughs> I'm showing you the starter version of it. There we go. <laughs> So I've done one extra thing this time. I've added little insight blocks for you. The insight blocks I'm hoping will help you understand what the step is supposed to be about. Okay? So for example, select and store the T-body HTML element. Underneath that is insight. We'll be storing the item entries in the T-body. Storing the HTML element will give us better access to add new items. <laughs> yeah. Just, just don't look at our G-Shift platform. <laughs> um, step two, select and store the item templates. All of this is in here, and anything... No, I didn't... Yeah, everything should be good. There's two spots that you have to uncomment code. Um, I can't remember where I put those. Uh, yeah, right here. Uncomment the next line, and uncomment this next line. So that could not be simple. You just literally remove the two slashes. <laughs> right? Now, people before said, oh, you know, I, I didn't like your steps, and I didn't want to do that, but I found it hard to follow. You don't need to do this at all. You can wipe this entire file, start from scratch, and build your own to-do list. That, I'm totally cool with that. If you want to use a framework like React, 
If you use a framework, I can guarantee you'll get a bonus. I can guarantee you, you will get a bonus if you use React or something like that, something heavy. In fact, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, not that far, <laughs> it says bonus, use prototyping, objects, storage solutions, frameworks, and or date plugins to demonstrate your knowledge outside learning. And that is worth 10 extra percent. Now, obviously, that's a range. <laughs> if you throw just a, an object in there, then I'm not going to give you 10%. You'll get an extra percent off that. But if you throw in a date picker and some prototyping, yeah, you'll probably get your 10%. If you throw a React in there, you're guaranteed to get 10%. 10% or 20%? What? 10% or 20%? 10. Yeah. Or 20. So wait, there's like 80% or... No, 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 you're, you're confusing that. So 10% is bonus. So you can get 110% on this. Oh. The 20% is on the take it further, right? So the take it further, this is code that, you know, you need to provide. So using CSS you learned in your first semester, style the to-do list to make it nicer than the default bootstrap styles. Right now, it's just default bootstrap with a little bit of far awesome in it, right? You want to go beyond that. Step 7B, hide the create new item form. So if you look at the current page, this is the create item form. What you want to do is hide it and make a button to make it appear, right? So that way it's not always there. That way you can see your to-do list. That is not that hard. Um, step 7C, add a button that toggles the create new items form visibility, right? Uh, step 7D, validate the date and alert the user if it is empty. Now, don't validate the format of it unless you really, really want to. There are pattern matchers and stuff. What I want you to do is basically just make sure the field is not empty. There's two ways you can do that. You can do it in JavaScript. You can also do it with a property on the field called required, <laughs> right? I'm open to either one. It's totally open to you. If you do JavaScript, I'll be happier. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, validate the date. Oh, step 7E, create a way for the user to edit the date. So I've already, like you already have created logic to in order for you to um, edit the, the entry. So editing the date will not be much different. That being said, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be in the date format. Okay, so I'm going to say that right now. It does not have to be in the date format. So if the person chooses to edit the date and they write happy birthday, then so be it. Okay, <laughs> that's totally fine. So you don't have to stress out about how am I going to make this a date. Okay, however, if you make it a date and you enforce it as a date, I'll give you the five, half of your bonus mark. I'll give you 5% for your bonus if you can make that a date. Okay, but don't stress yourselves out. Make it just take text first before you try to make it a date entry. Um, that's it. Any questions about this one? Pretty easy, pretty simple. That being said, don't wait to the absolute last minute. So you have, what week is this? 11. So you have all of this week, week 12, week 13, and week 14. I think I made it due. Yeah, there you go. The day before school is done. Because you guys are done that five minutes entirely. So you got a while, but don't wait to the last minute. And right now, I'm going to say right off the bat, zero extensions. The submission link will delete, it will disappear, and it will not be returned afterwards. I can't do extensions because the grades are due on the 22nd. So if I don't have your work, I can't mark it, I can't submit the grades. And just so you know, I have 173 items currently to mark that I haven't gotten to because I have two jobs. So I'm going to try to get to most of those this weekend because I actually have time this weekend to do it. Um, but yeah, so things pile up. When these get us uh, handed in, there'll be 82 of them. So I won't have time to take late submissions. All right. Any questions? No. Go ahead and work on your labs. Those of you that want to work on your assignments, it's totally cool. Yes, you can talk to me. Yes, you can ask me questions. All that type of happy stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One second. It was kind of a. Are you using All right. I will help you, and then I'll be over there to help. All right, Virginia. You are in a never-ending loop. Slowly, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's telling me. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, so it's telling you you have a reference error, is what the issue yeah, is. So on main.js, you have a five year reference error. So my activity is not open at all. This.card equals card. You're not passing the card. Uh, no, uh, this.card equals card. Add three properties to the value of the card and assign the two proper parameters to the corresponding values. Not, yeah, you do need it, but it's going to be this dot card, I believe. And it's just this dot card. I think. Let me double check. Um, uh, oh, I already have it complete. Yeah. Ah, where did that just go? Oh, uh, let's see here. Yes, it's just this dark card. It's an empty property, okay. which technically won't exist when it's created. It won't get copied over, but that's totally fine. It will be accessible. You'll just wind up creating it on the spot. Yeah, because you don't have a create function. You did it in a weird way, that's why. So, yeah, scroll down to where your create is. So, this would be create. Equals function, so that would be this dot create equals the function. Yay! And cards! Yay! Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, so it's just this <laughs> That's the only downfall to it, is you have to call the property. You can't actually just write it on the last one data. You have to actually use the property of those ones where you should have one channel. Yeah, so you can't try that. It will be at the Supreme. Yeah, but slowly every three cents on the No, so card.com. So, unfortunately, you can't do it this way. It has to be a property equals a function. You have to get the function. So, you have to do this.card equals this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have to get it in the same And then for the card, you have to just drop the variable. So, why? why? It's because um, we, we can't have a function within the function. Despite this lab having a lot more code in the research, we just like, damn it. <laughs> you need help, Ali? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> 
Right, so because it's in a function, this is where it's kind of confusing. So object literals use colon just to sum where you do property colon and property colon Yes. Function constructor objects, though, they use this dot property equals. It's actually not going to matter anyways because we can instantiate it. This draft card is not going to get copies of it, it doesn't have any value, which I didn't know until literally today. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't care. That's the thing. It's like, yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 That's putting a function in there that can't be called. You need to assign it, has, it to a it property. Has to sit in the person. Yeah, it has to be in the person. You need to assign it to a property. So the way you would do it is this dot create equals that function definition. So this dot create because what you're doing is you're taking the definition and making it the value of the property. If you wrote function create, there's no way to call it. Because it's sitting inside there and it doesn't actually get assigned to anything. And it just sits there. You could, but you still need to assign it to something. Which is sometimes the way people do it. They'll write like a function, like a main function inside, so that way it's, it's like encased and not available anywhere else. It's only within that class. But and then they would assign its return value to a property. You can see how kind of crazy, like, kind of it is. This is much easier to understand. You're just saying, hey, take this function definition and make it equal to create. So now when I call this dot create brackets, it executes. Why is this not? Are you? That bracket should equal it to that bracket. Oh, because you closed it. <laughs> so then you're closing the function. That's why it's screaming. Oh, it's still. Why? See, all of this is inside. So it's a closing bracket. It's there. These two match up. Are yep. using some lines. There's a package called. Whatever it is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And at the same time, it was like, you just start to melt at the same time. It's super It is. Yeah. Like, seriously, you need to start doing these courses. I can read for you. You just let me do yeah, yeah. I'm trying to see what it, yeah. My friend, um, or the guy that I work with, uh, Ilya, he took a, he didn't go through college to do what we do. He took a 12 week boot camp. He paid $12,000 for a 12 week boot camp. And it was all really full grand. 12 weeks, you come out with a piece of paper that's about the equivalent to it. But it's like, it's a boot camp. It's 12 hours a day for seven days a week. Oh, really? Yeah. Seven days a week? Seven days a week. So it's solid code. 12 weeks straight. Uh, 12 weeks straight. Wow. Yeah, in Ruby think... and then in JavaScript. And it's all just code. But the cool thing about it is no jet ads. Yeah. No other crap. It's literally it's just a code. Yeah. Yeah. What about the quality of the application? I don't know. He's good. He's smart. He's quick. But I don't know if that's just a thing. Yeah. Some, people are, <laughs> some people can approach right. code in a very abstract so way. Like, yeah. and they will like they will progress much further than other people because they call it abstract. They run it and he's like, yeah. 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 Do you know um, what we did that for? Um, I can ask him more. Yeah, I'm obviously better than Roma. Yes. yes. That's kind of cool, yeah, because right? those boot camp things, those papers are worth a lot to a lot of businesses. They love them. Yeah, because it's so it's so hardcore. Like, and you're taught things that you don't necessarily want to care. Like you're taught computer science things that you don't necessarily get here. Yeah. Alright. Is it working? Yeah, that was like a quarter of the episode. I'm sorry. 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 I'm
this That's a question for him, but it has to do <laughs> with it has to do with like we're not seeing that function within the function. So the, the class creates and we're setting it to a value. So we're setting it to that value, we're not actually following it. Okay, so it's, it's that's why we do that. Equals to what? Uh, function. I know it seems janky. Seems like it seems what? Well, it's this function create is equal to function of the selector? Yes. Okay. I am not sure to explain it. Or on <laughs> Is there anything in those brackets, Ali? No. Yes, selector. But that's what I put in. Yeah, I have to jump over to this fellow over here and then back. Yeah, this is the only college 
No, and because this is not a normal world, I'm just all the card connectors so the card will take, it out. you're calling card, right? Definitely. And it's going to take this as the object that it's parent. So it passes itself, right, into the parent constructor, and then whatever parameters, or whatever arguments the parent constructor requires. So card only requires one constructor, and that's valid, right? But then you have to pass the winning one into Charlotte. That's what you're doing in there. Pass the card into there, pass the balance. That's what essentially you're doing. So the example is in the exact same Diamond is the same, spade is the same, club is the same. So that's the same. Yeah, okay, right. Call the card yeah. so create a new instructor function called heart, right? That's the same as this guy's So you're creating an odds part this function value. So that's the same as the Call this value. So it'll be this heart. Uh, and then under names, you'll have to call the prototype just like you um, Just so you're aware, this is not Java, so you get that. Oh, in the okay. <laughs> but like, it's uh, not Sean coming over. It doesn't care. Like, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change this. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, Java is not like that. He's doing it. He isn't like that. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it Ruby doesn't even do it at all. I don't use prototypes whatsoever. No. <laughs> oh, you were next. Yes. Yes. Okay, so Sean, why do you have, like, uh, where is it? Step four. Yeah, step four. Why do we go, like, card drop or type drop or is equal to function? Because you're taking this property and giving it a value, right? Okay, so you can't just create a function. You have to somehow assign the value of the function, the function to that property. And the reason why you're using prototype is because when you create the function constructor, it creates this property called prototype. prototype. And you need, the only way you can actually add new functionality to it is through that super property. That's why I don't, this method is not my preferred method. I much more prefer the object over here. So we'll wait the second one we did? Yeah, the second one we did. Just because I think it's clear. Um, I think that was the real question. Oh, just my little bit of fun fantasy. Um, this dog card. Yeah, you're just basically. Okay, yeah, this is very well. Okay. And then the object constructor says, I don't give a shit. I put a value in it, so I'm not passing it over. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, just to make sure. Thanks, Sean. No worries. Okay, uh, uh, one second. Okay, uh, John, there's a book. There's a key. There's a. Yeah. This dog card. Because this is creating a function when you put it into the object. The only way you can do it is to do the properties. Yeah, sure, yeah. You can do this like that. That's all I'm here for. The rest of it is your function. Oh, so the cards here? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
four, five. Yeah, that's the same. All these are all 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 the same. so like the card, then you've got your suit, and 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 then you've got your Open up the open up the web page, look at it. Is, oh, it let them load so up and then we get two boxes and we'll change it. It should have errors. It's, no, it's, it's, yeah. It has its own no, errors. It's the issue. There we go. I'll make these ones. I'll make these ones. I'll make these ones. You're building the main.js actually building from the browser actually is less than the browser. browser. So what's happening is your IP is not a browser. It's not creating a document object, so it doesn't know what to do. I reference documents all the way. I do a super important post. Probably one of the main viewers would be why I Daniel, all see is bright color. Z -line. Z -line. Z -line. That's all you're supposed to see. <laughs> <laughs> they are just bright as so hell, man. Yeah. Oh, is that? Okay, sweet. Yeah. Um, they're like my test colors on each of the five. That's hilarious, man. That is great. Yeah. One second. I know there was somebody this way that asked me to give a shot. That's eight pieces. Hello. So, whatever, like, uh, Um, so far, create a new constructor function. Um, 
called heart. That's right, because you didn't call it the right thing. Look what it says. Heart, look how about it. It is a never ending. Right. Yeah, yeah, we do that. That's the same we even just like get a really good rough outline for what it's gonna entail. Yeah. I don't know what's causing that error. Is he getting the same one I got? The card dot create error, which is the gentleman over there is getting the same error. It's because of the it's because of the 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 Card dot create repeatedly telling you it was in there. Yeah. Oh, so, right. yeah. 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 Uh, Two day function. I don't ever do it that way though. I do const card equals function. That's the way I do it. Which is like the way I wrote it up there. The last thing. See, cots card no, as opposed to doing it. Both should work though. Both should work though. Both should like this, yeah, we have that comma, no, my that's the name of the card, is, which is um, heart, folks. Yeah. How does this do? And it's lowercase h, because it's going to be the class name. The change, uh, yeah, the class name, the one that's um, defined as the CSS style, it's the CSS style. And then the last thing is not in quotes, and it will be the value. So that's the last thing we got to use. Okay, brother. Then it's just that's why this create was just working because we're trying to call create oh, so like, I wanted to go somewhere. I kind of feel like they keep real stuff. I was like, I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah, was it because the first person wasn't created? Yeah. 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 So, I don't Like, all you need to do is like a bunch of things and shift and put it in the bag and send it to us and we'll be like, ah, 
Sorry, how did you get asked in your eyeball? Um, I was in a art lab and somebody had left uh, acid on the table, just like a pot of acid, and I was standing beside somebody and somebody dropped the plate down onto the glass and it was just like splash up in my face, up in my eye, and I felt it in my eye first. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to etching, for etching, to, to get rid of like, to really do the luminous. Yeah, like really hard. Yeah. Well, it's what are you still have to and I like yeah, so one of these put my face in the eye wash station. It's still that is like waterboarding, by the way. Yes, yeah, actually, that it is. Yeah. It is basically waterboarding. I am ready for oh spy God. training. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're done. Done. Fun. Fifteen minutes in an eye wash station. It's brown. Yeah, yeah. Got a piece of silicon in my eye, and I had to go to the hospital for it because it will inflame. Oh yeah, do bad things to your eyes. Anyways, yeah, they attach this gizmo to your eye so it doesn't feel like it's sucking your eyeball out of your head because the water has to go in and around the eyeball. Because it, and it can't, it can't like move it too much because if it goes in there, it can get behind your eyeball. Oh, we can't like shut it past. Oh yeah. my god, it's the worst feeling in the world. Alright, this call, basically what it does is it says, call the object you're currently calling. <laughs> Pass it all of this information. Create a instantiated version, and then pass its prototype and properties back and assign them to heart. And yeah, I the base you're making is the base I made when I first did it, and was like, what? Why? Why is this so magical? That's why I really prefer the literal objects more. I think it's much better to use your understanding. To the big old this from now the hide. This is my little for about a hard hide. That is a good thing. And that stays in your skin, too. Like my my value is the argument that you're passing. Art is the class in CSS. You can actually see that if you go look at the constructor. I was looking to like go into. Because the constructor for card. Yeah. Because Debbie looks so much better than Lightning. Right there. The zoom with the value, well, that's what you're passing. Heart is suit, value is value. There is no way in the sciences is not. It is definitely. That's true. That's true. That's true. You have to deal with like yeah. telling them you feel sorry. That's why don't lose lost. that page because uh, any of the stuff that's on the test, you'll want that product. And any, any questions could be directed. But I would mostly just be I won't like throw them. I have to address the same way as well. Yeah, oh, good. I would be very good. Yeah, that's awesome. Sell it to the zombies. That's what I would do. Thank you for the question. So what? Cool. Nobody's starting on the side of the two right now? I was going to, but I'm sorry. I'm just going to go home. 
Yeah, or I'm gonna go build up my little task list of things. Well, it's 6:30. I mean, that's not a bad time to end. Yeah. 6:30 is 6:30 is a good time. Let's see. So we have one and a half minute.